So hello and welcome to our Thursday weekly drop-in meeting for the National Safer Supply Community of Practice. I'm Robin Calda and I'm one of the knowledge mobilization folks with the NSS COP. So our meeting format, this is the welcome and updates part. And then today we will move into, um, it's not so much a guest presentation as a sort of workshop on wound care, which uh, is, will be very exciting. And then if there's time at the end, we'll have community updates and discussion. So acknowledging colonialism in the past and the present, we come together in this community of practice from across Turtle Island as people who live on treaty lands and ceded and unceded territories. Our team and community of practice members are comprised of individuals and organizations from across Turtle Island. We are all treaty people. We work in a sector whose goal is to address social and structural harms. We've recognized that the production of these harms comes from our colonial history and its enduring practices, institutions, and ways of thinking in our ongoing daily lives. We know that Indigenous people, as well as members of the African, Caribbean, and Black communities are disproportionately harmed and criminalized by drug policies rooted in race, racism and colonialism. Colonialism is with us today, and we commit to working in ways that transform racist and colonial institutions and practices, to repair harms, to prevent future harms, and to work towards a more inclusive and just future. Our meeting goals are to build a supportive, collaborative, and inclusive safer supply community and to connect, share, and learn from each other. We have some participation guidelines, so please participate in whatever ways feel comfortable for you. There's no obligation to talk. We recognize that listening is participation, and you can have your camera on or off, whichever is most comfortable for you. If you'd like to speak, please use the raise hand feature, or if it's really quiet, you can just jump in, you can type in the chat, um, a whole bunch of options there, but please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking to minimize the background noise for everybody. Um, please use inclusive, respectful, and people-first language. For example, people use drugs and avoid labeling other people. And we recognize that people may sometimes cause unintentional harm, and in these cases we will call people in. We will have a certificate of attendance, um, so if you'd like one for any reason at all, we put a link in the chat about sort of 40, 45 minutes into the meeting. You just need to follow the link, give it your name and email address, and it will automatically email you a certificate. We have a webinar coming up in, ooh, in two weeks and one day. Um, Rebecca, did you want to talk to this one? Um, sure, I was just looking to see if Maria's here. I don't see Maria, Maria. But uh, okay, yeah, so this is going to be fantastic. This is the um, peer work research project. Uh, they're sharing, the team is sharing their findings from this project. Uh, and they're going to be presenting the findings, but also um, running a workshop about how to take the findings and the recommendations and put them into action. Um, and for any of the organizations that are planning, to apply to SUA using priority one, strengthening the workforce for people um, who use drugs and with lived experience, lived and living experience. This session is a must. So please pass on um, to all the people, uh, your organizations and such, uh, to come to, to uh, this uh, presentation and workshop about uh, basically strengthening the workforce of people who use drugs and making work uh, conditions um, equitable, safe, and um, positive and all the good things, yeah. Great, so that's it for me. So I will turn it over to Rebecca to introduce our guests for today. Yeah, oh, I also want to um, just quickly tell people we're gonna be sharing slides in this presentation um, and so what I wanted to make sure people know how to do is to be able up in your right hand corner of your screen, if you're looking at a laptop or a computer, you can set it so that you can see um, the viewing of people. So instead of just having the screen dominate, you can set it to, uh, I think it says side by side. Uh, I've already set up the screen or the PowerPoint or sharing my screen. So now I can't see it. Am I explaining this Mike. properly so that you can see the speakers as well? You can set it up side by side. What does it say, Alex? Do you know what I'm talking about? Side by side. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think what you're wanting to let people know is that they can change how the screen looks depending on what you see, what you want to see or what you don't want to see. So the standard view is if you go to the top right of your like zoom box, there's sign in and then there's view. And the first one is the standard where you have like the, the heads at the top and then the slide underneath. Um, and then the side by side is uh, it's got like just the speaker. So whoever is like um, making like green around their little like zoom box will be like the one, like the head that you like see. And then at that side is then the slides. Then there's the uh, side by side gallery, which is like what I think probably is the standard or default for everyone right now. So you like see, or maybe for just for me, but like you see all of the webcam like videos, but it's like all in a column going down. And then again, at the side, you see the uh, the slides. I think you can also hide, so you can also hide non-video participants who are just like black boxes. If that's distracting for you, you can also hide your self view if you don't wanna look at yourself the entire time. <laughs> you can also make it uh, full screen too. Oh, and also if you, um, I don't know, don't, don't wanna look at the slides or don't want them as big, you can adjust like the size of the screen with the little pull, uh, there's like a, a pull tab thing that makes it smaller or bigger. Yeah, yeah. So just wanted to people, because sometimes people wanna see the person talking, it's easier than just the screen, just the slide shares. Okay, so I'm so happy. Um, I, I don't know how long ago, maybe a year and a half ago, we had Pat and Aaron um, come and do a couple of uh, presentations with us about wound care. And we have those on our uh, website, uh, the recordings of those. Um, but boy, we it, we felt like it was time for an update, um, both to ref a refresher for all of us. Also, our membership has grown tremendously. Pat and Aaron, we now have over 1,500 members. Um, and uh, yeah, and growing, growing. Um, so it was time to make this available to others. Also, we re recognize that with the ongoing um, changes to drug supplies, that there are, you know, the contaminants, uh, the presence of xylazine, um, they're presenting new kinds of wounds um, for folks or, um, or more wounds, I, like that's something I need to learn and understand. So we thought it was a good opportunity to uh, connect with Aaron and Pat and Heather, there's Heather, um, to have them come in and share their knowledge with all of us. So yes, please, Pat and Aaron, I'd love for you to introduce yourselves and take it from here. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, really happy to be here. And I was, um, I'm really excited to uh, be with this group today. I really want, um, I'm hoping that folks will be interested in sharing um, what they're seeing and what strategies they're engaging um, and what's going on, uh, because I think we learn so much uh, from just hearing what other people are seeing and and in that way being in a community of practice, which is is the point here, right, um, of this good work um, that this team is doing. So, um, yeah, I think um, we can advance to the next slide. Um, and I will just say, um, that uh, I work uh, and live on Treaty 13 territory, as does Heather. Um, we are located in Toronto right now at the Moss Park Consumption and Treatment Service where we both work. Um, and Pat was born and raised on Treaty 13 territory and has recently moved to London. So I believe that is territory that is under the two row uh, Wampum Belt Covenant with the Haudenosaunee. And if anybody has um, further details to fill in, please do. Um, or let us know what territory um, and treaties um, you are you are in as you watch this webinar. Um, and then I have my colleague Heather here with me. Hi, Heather. What do you want to say about yourself? Uh, oh, um, 
I've been involved in harm reduction in some way or another for over 20 years. I've seen a lot of changes and a lot of positive and negative things. Uh, I'm really interested in community wound care and yeah. And uh, yeah. Howdy. So Heather's going to be kind of maybe popping in and out a little bit because Sorry, we're, having, guys. we're having a dynamic kind of day at the site. So please, uh, bear with us but happy to have heather join I'll us i'll be back 10 15 okay yeah. um and i'm a nurse and i've been working with the mossport consumption and treatment service um since it's opened and even before it opened when it was um yeah, you coming now sorry <laughs> when it was um in the park um as an unsanctioned um service so that's kind of my background uh can you advance to the next slide please and then actually you can see all of us. Um, and for full disclosure, I'm a wound care nepo baby. Um, Pat is my aunt. And <laughs> um, and Pat is someone who inspired me to go into nursing. And she is somebody who is known um, like worldwide even for her expertise in wound care. This has been like her passion for her career. Um, and so when I got into when I got into nursing and especially in community nursing in this kind of a setting, um, I was often tapping on her for advice and guidance about things. Um, and so she has helped me to start to develop some some expertise in wound care. And it's been a good knowledge exchange because I've also been able to share some of the work that I've been part of in terms of, you know, bringing harm reduction philosophy to um, healthcare. So. Um, Pat, is there anything else that you wanted to add there for introduction? No, I don't think so. I um, I have been um, I have been nursing for probably longer than most of you on the call have been alive. Uh, but I'm very happy that Erin decided to follow in both her mother and my footsteps and and go into nursing. And uh, it it's been a fun journey and. As you say, Aaron, it's been a, a back and forth because we've both been able to help one another. So, yeah, it's been it's been a good duo, and um, certainly in the chronic wound care world, uh, dealing with the types of wounds that are being dealt with out in the community is important for that wound care world to know exists and is going on and. Um, the appropriate um, management and prevention. Prevention and management of comes first. Okay, shall we move on? Yeah. So, so oh, oh, you're doing this one? No, you do. Go. <laughs> it's also, I'm having a dynamic time in my head as well today. Okay. Um, just quickly, the objectives. Um, we want to spend some time talking about you know, defining chronic versus acute wounds, because I think sometimes getting your head around what's a chronic wound versus what's an acute wound can really, um, really, really help in terms of thinking about how you're going to look at the wound going forward and how you're going to support the wound care. Um, Pat's going to talk about uh, wounds and infections, as well as basic principles of wound care that are sort of universal. And I think this is a you know, as, as things are being, uh, new things are coming into um, the drug supply and we're talking more about xylazine and the impact that that's having on skin. Um, I think going back to those basic principles of wound care and really having a good handle on those will help us to um, address any new challenges that we're seeing um, in the community. So then we're also gonna talk about how to assess, cleanse and about things to consider in, in uh, in dressing a wound um, with the understanding that um, you may or may not be dressing wounds, right? Like often that's something that um, the nurse on the team will do. Um, but even if you're not doing dressing changes yourself, there's still um, good things to know to support the process in general. Um, we're gonna talk about how to support people with wounds and I'm hoping you're gonna talk to us about how to support people with wounds. Um, and explore some tools and resources. And really, again, I wanna have that discussion. I'm so interested to hear what people are seeing and uh, what's been challenging and what you've been finding effective.
So we want to look at uh, what causes infection. Uh, and, um, you know, we all know that there's bacteria in wounds. So that's the pathogen. But one of the pieces that we tend to forget is the person that has the infection. So the host, what um, challenges is that host having uh, with their immune system? And the more immune compromised, and that can be in many ways. So the determinants of health are, are really important to uh, provide people with the optimal um, ability to resist getting an infection. So good nutrition and housing and uh, access to care, all of these and management of any chronic diseases that happen to be going on there like diabetes and um, the uh, arthritis and all of these kinds of things all affect that, that individual. So the more compromised that individual is, the more the ability of that bacteria to proliferate. So there is a, a whole um, a continuum of how that bacteria proliferates. And Erin, I don't think one of the um, uh, references we included was the uh, inf infectious um, disease, uh, not the, inf the Infection Institute and their guidelines. And we can possibly distribute that to anyone that's interested because they have just been updated and it is a coming together of experts and it's a consensus document about looking at the progression of, of infection. And we know that um, all wounds, uh, all chronic wounds, and we'll get to defining that in a minute, are contaminated. And as the bacteria in that wound um, multiplies, it moves from being contaminated to colonized, and you're gonna to start to run into problems there. And then it comes into a superficial infection, which this group has broken down into two categories. And then you get into your systemic infection, which is your fever and all of the things that we know that people run into um, when they become very ill. So not only is it bacteria, but there can be viruses that cause those um, those problems within our immune system. And fungus can also be one of the pathogens that's there. So you really need to know the history of the individual when you're, you're looking at infection. Um, what are, as, as Aaron has put in the slide here, you know, when did they, the person last have a decent meal? And this isn't only people who um, don't have a solid roof over their head. This is for elderly people. One of my favorite stories that was shared by a colleague of mine was she had um, an elderly person she was visiting and she asked this individual if she was eating well and the person replied, yes, my dear, I have tea and toast for breakfast and toast and tea for supper. Well, we all know that this is not going to support health at all. So we really need to be able to look at um, a person's intake and help um, help support that in, in any way that we can. And um, I just, if I may, Erin, um, here in London, they have started a program where they have set up certain sites that people uh, who are living rough can come and actually get um, bottled water and a decent um, meal once a day. And I think this is really helping um, to keep, um, the, keep people healthier. But you really do need to know what else is going on. So other comorbidities are diabetes and, as I mentioned, arthritis. Uh, and there are uh, just a plethora of other chronic illnesses that are out there. And so I would say, if I can jump in, I think mm -hmm. one thing that I learned, um, I think from you, Pat, was that, um, and it makes a lot of sense, is that one of the key things that people need in order to heal wounds is protein. 
like having adequate protein is so important for wound healing. So having a well-rounded diet, but like with that good protein, just like you need protein to build muscles, you need protein to heal wounds. Yeah. And that, that is so important. And if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, how are you going to get good protein? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's really, you know, we, we tend to not pay probably as much attention to nutrition as we should, uh, but it is becoming in my world of chronic wounds is becoming uh, more of a focus. So <laughs> Those uh, pathogens also, um, you know, they proliferate in certain living conditions and they can just grow and they can spread. So again, it's really important to know that individual. And the only way that you can really get to know the individual is by gaining their trust and them getting to know you and you getting to know them. And I know when I first started nursing, you did not discuss anything about yourself, um, which really put up a barrier when you're trying to get to know someone. Because if you're not willing to share a little bit about yourself, then someone isn't going to share about themselves in a truly open area. Uh, did you want to address the last point on this screen, Erin? I That's do. Not all and I, yes. I first wanted to add one thing, because I when you were talking about um, about the pathogens, it, it was there was a lot there and it was dense. And I think um, just to go back to that, um, I always think about how like if, you know, you swabbed my skin on any given day, if you swabbed like the skin on my arm right now. It might return back positive with Staph aureus, which is a really common um, bacteria that can cause, you know, cellulitis, can cause results in abscesses. But that doesn't mean that I have cellulitis or an abscess. It just means there's staph on my skin. And really, there's like staph on everybody's skin. Um, so like a perfectly healthy person, we're going to have bacteria just on our skin at all times. And that's okay. And that's normal. And our immune systems are pretty good at, um, you know, not letting that affect us. Like our, our skin is a barrier, right? Um, it's when that stuff gets in somewhere where it can then proliferate. And if the host is, has any kind of, you know, compromise for any reason, like a underlying health condition or malnutrition, like we were talking about, then that's when it becomes a problem. But just, I think to keep that in mind, like the staff is everywhere and other stuff, but the staff for sure. And then this last point, and I think everybody on this webinar knows this, um, is that not all skin and wound infections are caused by drugs and or injecting. We know that sometimes, the other healthcare providers that we're interacting with don't know this. Um, and I think that's why the advocacy that, that we do with people and the support that we give people when they have to interact with, you know, the hospital or maybe their family doctor who's not so like hip to how things are, um, that we can be there to remind them of these things um, and support that. Because I think what we often see is that folks who use drugs, um, they interact with like the hospital and everything gets blamed on the drug use. Like everything that's wrong in that person's life is the fault of the drug use. And we know that's not true. And that's a lot of the advocacy that I know we're all doing um, out in the community. It's an assumption that people make uh, without getting the full story. And so, you know, it, you can't emphasize enough the fact that getting that really good history is important because those those wounds can be there for a variety of reasons. Uh, and, and just, Erin, you bring up a good point about a swab. Um, many people will think that there might be an infection going on there, and they want to do a swab to diagnose the infection. Well, a swab doesn't diagnose an infection, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later about the signs and, and symptom of infection. But it, it um, what the swab does is tell you what the particular bacteria, what antibiotic it might be susceptible to or what it isn't susceptible to. So doing a swab doesn't diagnose that infection. And, and we deal with this all the time because 
oh, that looks like it's infected, we should do a swab. Well, no, let's not go there just yet. So mm -hmm. I think we need to move on, Erin. <laughs> yeah, next slide, sorry. Okay. So one of the things that um, we in our world of chronic wounds, but also applies to everybody with a chronic or an acute wound is we need to remember that the wound is on a person and the person is in their environment and their environment is within a system. So you need to not only look at that hole in the person, but you need to look <laughs> at that whole person and the environment of where they're living and the system where they're in. And Erin, if I may tell the story about your first time you tried to publish uh, and the use of the local wound care, if that's okay with you. That looks too embarrassed me. Yeah, go ahead. And no, it's not an embarrassment. It's really good. Erin um, uh, did publish a case study and it was sent to a wound care journal. And one of the people that was reviewing the study uh, sent a message back to Erin about why she used the particular local wound care that she did. And she contacted me and my question to her was, so else, what else do you have? And she said, nothing. So I said to her, that's what you answer back to the reviewer. There was nothing else available. So I did the best that I could within the environment and the system within which I was working. And the article got published very nicely. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so we all have these ideals of where we want to be, but it's getting there. And we have to work with what we have uh, within that environment, within that system. So just remember, please, doesn't matter what the wound is, it's on a person in an environment within a system. And we all have to work with that. We move on. Mm -hmm. And then this again, just to say, and I just like, it's like, a, this is a stock photo, I guess, of somebody getting their blood drawn. Um, but I just think it's funny because that's not really how you draw blood. And also this person is not wearing gloves, which... If, if your vena puncturist is not wearing gloves, you could ask them to, that would be totally within um, your rights. And, um, but also, you know, encouraging folks to like wear gloves if they're assisting. Sometimes it works for people, sometimes it doesn't, but that's one way to prevent like the staph aureus on your own hands from getting onto the skin of the person who is having the vena puncture done um and potentially getting that staff into their bloodstream um so that's why i like this picture but i also just wanted to take a moment to um it's not so much wound related but this is like kind of the same on the continuum of the same process so if there is bacteria on the skin and it's not cleaned off um prior to um injecting um then it can get pushed into the bloodstream and or it can get pushed into the tissues as well, right? If a shot goes interstitial or if you miss, right? So then you've got that bacteria, say, in the tissues, which can be a place where that bacteria might proliferate. The bacteria can also go into the bloodstream and it can, it's sort of like the bloodstream becomes like a highway for the bacteria to go and like seed wherever it feels like it. So we see endocarditis where bacteria has seeded in the heart. We see sometimes um, septic arthritis where bacteria seeds in a joint. And we sometimes see um, see that bacteria seeded, you know, in a spine, you know, spinal abscess or discitis that we sometimes see. So just um, to think about that kind of continuum of how the introduction of the bacteria can um, have different, um, different outcomes. Um, and it could be nothing. The body could just deal with it, chew it up, and it's not a problem. Occasionally it is a problem and there are different ways in which that bacteria can cause problems. The other thing out of this picture, Erin, I would hope is that the individual has washed their hands before they started the process. And um, I think hand hygiene uh, was really emphasized during COVID, but I think it's something that, that we should be aware of whenever we're doing care or whenever an individual is doing their own care, if they have access to either the alcohol hand rub or um, soap and water, which might be a little bit more difficult, uh, especially in areas where 
the water isn't the best it can be. Um, it's important that we cleanse our hands and cleanse them properly. And there's also um, the Ontario government has a very good um, step process for hand washing and how to do it. Um, that is, I think, um, given to by the public health and through the workplace safety um, that can be posted and even handed out for people who are interested in learning about it. So moving on, we're not going to make our hour, Erin. We've got too much to say. Oh my goodness, okay. <laughs> so um, when we're looking at people, as I said, that, that wound is on that person. So the person is actually the center of the care. The person and their circle of care, so their family or their friends or whoever they're closest with, are really at the center when you're, you're trying to help individuals um, get those wounds to, to heal. And one of the things, again, that we are really adamant about is that we would like people to adhere to a plan of care rather than comply to a plan of care. So compliance actually means to follow an order. And I would ask each and every one of you who drive a car, how many of you actually comply with the speed limit at all times? My guess is uh, not a whole bunch. When you're adhering to a plan of care, you're agreeing that whatever is um, decided for with, with all of the team, what's ever decided is something that you as an individual and your circle of care can buy into and can um, follow and um, move forward with. So, we really like to use the word um, adherence or if your British concordance is the other word, not the word compliance. We just know, you know, somebody tells you to do something and the first thing you think of is, I'm not gonna do that. I can't do that. Uh, so please, um, if you take nothing away from today, please don't say that people are non-compliant because they have reasons for not being able to um, follow the agreed upon plan of care. So you need to uh, be able to also treat the cause. And this goes back to the, the new additives that are coming out within the, the drugs that people are um, using. The, you don't have control over what additives are in. You don't have control over the supply. You need to know what's in there. Would you agree, Erin? Yeah, and I think I think we're doing that with the drug testing yeah. projects that are happening. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to know what's in there and you you don't because you don't have control over that, you need to know it may affect um it may cause a wound, it may be the cause, but you can't fix that. So you need to do what you can to um uh, optimize all the other stuff that's going happening around the cause. You need to look at the local wound care, um, cleansing the wound. Uh, and it's uh, interesting that um, we talk about not anointing the wound, but actually really cleansing the wound. So um, not necessarily scrubbing because it, that will be sore, but really giving it a good, uh, if you can see the wound base, a good irrigation or a good soaking. If possible, getting that necrotic tissue debrided, making sure that that bacteria isn't moving towards the infection stage and the moisture balance is obtained through the local wound care that you use. You may or you may not have access to uh, a plethora of local wound care dressings out there. I think there's a catalog um, that has somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000 different uh, local wound care products. Um, we were in the Yukon a couple of years ago and their problem was they had access to so much, they didn't know what to use. 
where in other instances, you don't have anything. So you have to use the best that you can. We move on to the next slide. Um, the one thing I wanted to add to that quickly, the debridement. So in a clinical sense, that's a fairly like advanced skill is to remove necrotic tissue and sometimes even um, some of the healthy tissue. Um, so some nurses in the community will do it. In my experience, most don't do a ton of, of debridement, but it is getting that necrotic tissue off of off of the wounds because that can impede wound healing. Um, I certainly wouldn't suggest if, if you, <laughs> anyone go at anyone with any sharp objects. I don't do it. I don't I don't recommend it in the community. I think what we all do see, though, is that people um, like do self debridement often um and i think sometimes that has good results and i think sometimes it can be a risk for introducing new bacteria into the wound so i think we are just think about all of that harm reduction stuff that we're already doing so um are the instruments being used sterile um is hand hygiene being done maybe can gloves be worn so those are just some things to think about when we're working with folks who are doing their own doing uh doing self-debridement just Aaron, uh, just so you know that your folks aren't the only ones that do that. There yeah. is a condition called hydridinitis suppurativa, which is a condition where people get boils and abscesses and um, they don't want to go to emerge and wait 10 hours to have that area incised and drained. So they do it themselves. Uh, and again, it's the same kind of issues. Mm -hmm. that you're talking about yeah so I wanted to throw in here to get some feedback from folks if you could put it in the chat or raise your hand but what are the things that you are doing to prevent wounds in the first place in the setting that you're working in anyone anyone um, just encourage people to like uh, be sterile as uh, sterile as possible with their equipment and uh, be like just as clean as possible if if they can. Yeah, thank you, Maria, and nice to see you, Megan. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Yeah, oh. it's important to keep. Um, sorry, go ahead. Somebody was going to speak. Oh, I was just going to add, I, uh, yeah, I just sort of quickly raised my hand. I just wanted to add, yeah, just in, getting information out there about the importance of, of, of clean needles, of where to access, uh, where to get clean needles, like with the, the where, where there's where there's sites that you know harm reduction supplies are available. Um, just yeah, raising awareness about about what, what's available in terms of um in terms of care, wound care, and stuff like that. Like just awareness, I think, is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Also, like letting people know, like the resources. Yeah, like he said, uh, in the areas uh, as well, like where it could be best for them to get help. But that maybe they won't have to wait ten hours and emerge, or like like a local uh, health center or something. Um, as well as like letting them know, like the, the possible like risks and benefits of of them uh, taking care of it themselves, and um, just any any helpful tips that you might have. Yeah, I like that. The the warm referrals is really important. And then I think Aisha has a hand up. Yes, hi, um, I'm Aisha. Uh, before I start, I'd actually like to do a small land acknowledgement. Is that okay? Yeah, so I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Coquitlam, Katsi, Musqueam, and Salia Watooth nations. I respect their deep connection to this land and their continued care for it. Um, if um, any of y'all are familiar with the Coast Salish peoples then, and the Coquitlam, then you would know that I am in BC. I currently do outreach out in the Coquitlam area, and we've encountered a lot of folks um, with various um, skin conditions. And uh, one thing we are doing is just um, talking to them about the xylazine and honestly raising awareness and we do have wound care. I'm here because um, we are very small nonprofit, limited resources, and we just we want to step up our game. We're seeing more and more people being affected by the xylazine, and not a lot of folks actually know what it is. Um, 
last night, for example, we encountered someone who had, who thought it was, um, who could, who thought it could have been, I'm not too sure, but they said that it was um, a splinter that had then gotten infected and it, it made their pointer finger like the size of three fingers. It was enlarged. The skin was like scabby and we, um, we did not have a lot of resources on hand. We like put, um, I think we had like a gauze pad and we, we like dumped a bunch of sterile water on it. Um, and then we put like a gauze pad and some medical tape. Well, we tried bandages at first because we didn't know we had medical tape and we found medical tape. So we used that. Um, but it's mostly just talking to people and seeing what they know about it, what more they like, what more we can teach them about. And also learning what the folks on in the communities call this stuff. Like I've heard crocodile teeth. Last night I heard trank for the first time. Mm-hmm. And everyone kind of has a different view of what the xylazine is and what it's doing and what it even is the purpose of what the purpose of the xylazine even is for the substances. Um, yeah, so yeah. I am here to learn um, and I would love all the tips to step up our weed care game. Thank you, Aisha. You brought up some really good stuff and I and we'll I think we'll come back to it in, in further slides. Um, you're like ahead of us already. Um, but Sorry, yeah, I was like, no, no, my, first, my one chat speak. Let me go quick. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great. You're like mine is uh, in totally the right direction. And I'm gonna come back to we'll come back to the xylazine and the and the in the moment kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, but it sounds like you did all the right things for that finger. Thank you. I'm hoping it's a little better now. Um. Can we advance the slides? Thank you for all of that. And I think um, I put this list um, of things and everybody's kind of mentioned this stuff. It's like the queen, the um, the new equipment, um, the hand hygiene, rotating sites, we know about that, supporting people in the healthcare system. And then honestly, I think let's not forget we're here because of safe supply and safe supply is itself a way of treating the cause because we know what's in the pharmaceutical medications. Um, and that's a way of, of, of preventing, of preventing wounds. So uh, we're doing it right as a community. And the next slide. Okay. Pat. So when we're, yeah, when we're looking at how wound heals, there are actually four phases that, a wound goes through. This applies to a finger, a paper cut on a finger, and it applies to a wound that's been there for a longer period of time. So the first phase is the immediate response where you stop the bleeding. The second phase is that inflammatory phase. It usually lasts uh, up to four days. It could be longer depending on the, the extent of the injury, but that's where you get the redness and the swelling. And then you get into the proliferation phase that can last anywhere up to 21 days. Again, all of this um, depends on the extent of the injury, but that's when you see the new skin begin to grow. And with chronic wounds though, and I will define that in the next couple of slides, it can take up to two years for that wound to fully heal. And when it does, it's only, close to 80% strength of what it was before it broke down. So the longer these wounds are present, the less good uh, closure they have. So a a paper cut on a finger will probably go away in in about seven days. It'll be totally done and there's no uh, damage to the underlying tissue. But with a wound that's been there for um, three, four, five, six months, a year. We've seen some people that have had wounds for 10 years. Uh, they're very difficult to get moving. We'll go on to the next one, which defines the... Um, so just so we're all talking about the same thing, the definition uh, of an acute wound is a wound that occurs when the integrity of any tissue is compromised. So skin breaks, muscle tears, burns, uh, or bone fractures. 
Uh, and this is also uh, when the tissue is compromised, when abscesses are formed. The, the wound may be caused, as you can read on the screen here, by gunshots, a surgical procedure, an infectious disease, or it may be an under, a result of an underlying condition. And it's not only um, there are other drugs that will create a problem with wounds. Uh, so we, we need to be aware of those as well. A chronic wound by definition, which is the next slide, is a wound that fails to progress through that sequence of healing in a timely and orderly sequence. And it can go through that repair process, but it doesn't restore that um, anatomical and with, it doesn't restore with good anatomical and functional results. And this is a picture of a chronic wound that's been around um, you can see some purpley pink areas around the edges, and that's actually a new skin that is forming. So if you see that, you're on the right path. You can see the redness in there, and that's called granulation tissue. Uh, and that is a precursor to that purpley pink um, tissue that you're seeing around the edge. So that's if you've got a wound that's been there for a length of time. That's the progress that you want to see. Can we move on to the next slide. So in terms of assessing, cleansing and dressing, um, assessment is a thing I've been thinking about a lot lately and especially in the context mm -hmm. of um, all the talk that's happening about xylazine um, to go back to Aisha's point. Um, and I think it's important for us to talk about. So there isn't a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of consensus about what exactly the cutaneous or skin effects are of xylazine. Um, and I think that's because it's a new thing that we're encountering. So we haven't found like standardized ways to describe it, to understand it. And so I would encourage us all to try to find some common language around it because that will help us to um, be more clear in understanding like is that a wound that's related to xylazine if so what's the significance of that what are the characteristics of the wound because it's actually the characteristics of the wound that are going to guide our management of the wound so is there a lot of necrotic tissue is there a lot of drainage is there actually infection that, re that requires systemic antibiotics or you know local bacterial management so um, in terms of assessment, it's finding ways to common language to describe where the wound is, its size, how much gunk is coming out of it, and is it pussy or is it like um, like thin straw-like fluid? Um, what are the borders like? How deep is it? Is there tunneling? Like, is there? Um, could you? How do I describe tunneling with words? Like, can you probe down into it? Often. Um, abscesses have some tunneling there's like a fair bit of depth to them um is there erythema so like is there redness is there warmth is there swelling um and a picture is worth a thousand words depending on where you work and what your policies are um and with much much consideration for privacy um pictures can be an option but definitely check with your organization and if that's a possibility it isn't always mm -hmm. um, but we want to be um, on the same page about how we're describing wounds so that we know what we're talking about um, and next slide so just to, to the pictures Erin um, oh, yeah. you know, pictures can can be utilized in many ways if all of the things that are in place that need to be in place it can help um, you as the care provider or the person that's helping the individual see the progress or regression of what's happening, but it also can help the individual with the wound to see that progress or regression. Mm -hmm. And um, some of these wounds occur in places that you can't see yourself. So if someone else is taking a picture of that wound for you, you have a better idea of what you're dealing with because dealing with the unknown in a lot of instances is far more stressful than dealing with what you know. Now, some people may not like to look at their wounds and that's that's okay, um, but let them have the option and don't make that uh, assumption that they don't want to see. 
So we should move on, right? Yes. Uh, one of the ways to look at whether there's an infection there or not is this uh, mnemonic that Dr. Gary Sybil came up with. Uh, it's nerds and stonies. And um, looking at the superficial, uh, in, uh, superficial part of an infection, the wound isn't getting better. There is um, gunk, as Aaron so uh, brilliantly put it. That's a brilliant medical term because people don't know what exudate is. So describe the gunk. Is it, does it look like pus? It doesn't look like clear fluid. Um, does it look like blood? Does it look like thin down blood? If you um, uh, describe it that way. When you touch it, does it bleed really easily? And that's known in the medical uh, realm as friable tissue. Is there debris or is there junk is the other way to talk about it. So is there yellow stringy stuff in, um, in that wound? And is there an odor? And I must say about an odor, if a person says their wound smells, it smells. Uh, you may not smell it, but they're living with it. So you really need to listen to them if they say it smells. And especially if it's a new smell that hasn't been there before. That's a really good indicator that something is going on. The other piece for deeper uh, involvement in the tissue is if that wound is getting larger than when it was assessed uh, prior and by assessing it, we talk about measuring it, uh, how big is it, and how long is it, how wide is it? Um, is there an increase in temperature? And simply by putting the back of your hand on someone's skin around the wound and on an area further away from the wound. I don't know about you, but my mother would always put her hand on my forehead when she was feeling for a temperature as a kid. So it's a tried and true way of doing it. There are infrared thermometers out there that you can use. Uh, but you may not have the uh, capacity to have those. Erin, do you have an infrared thermometer in your clinic? Yeah. So they are helpful. They can, they're, you can get them at the um, um, Canadian Tire and Princess Auto and shops like that. They have them on sale for about 30 bucks. Um, and they're relatively easy to use. If you're going to use it, use it in the Fahrenheit mode, not the centigrade mode. If you have the ability, if you can see bone or if you can probe to bone, uh, that's another sign that there may be something deeper going on. If there is a wound and then you see little areas around the wound um, breaking down, that's new areas of breakdown. If that uh, fluid that's coming out is there and if it's at increased. If there's a redness and swelling, you will see that normally around the wound. But if it increases, then um, you, you want to be aware of that. And again, the smell is there. So that's one way of kind of remembering what to think about when you're assessing um, a wound for infection. And we move on to the next one. Um, wait, can we go? Can we go back? Just for, I just want to make one quick point. Yeah. Um, just to be very clear that the top, the nerds section, that's, those are signs of, um, of infection, but that you want to treat topically. So we have like superficial infection or colonization. So there's bacteria happening and we want to management, manage it. But in these, with these signs, there's the potential that we can just treat it topically. So something on the wound or something in the dressing and the stonies is where you're needing to get into um, oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics, but I think just knowing that there's kind of a range where you can still manage topically without antibiotics, um, but then it can progress uh, to needing different kind of management. And the other piece I forgot on this is um, increased pain. It is a symptom uh, as opposed to a sign, but uh, there was a study done in, um, in England um, by Sue Gardner and she looked at people with um, infected wounds and 100% of them reported increased pain. So that if, um, when using this, um, it has been validated, this uh, Nerds and Stonies, and they found that with three or more positives, um, that it 
would indicate either a superficial or a deeper infection. If you only had two, but you had increased pain, the pain would count as one of those. So that if there was um, increased exudate and um, a lot of debris and increased pain, uh, that would be considered a superficial infection that you would treat topically. Okay, I think we've covered it all. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna give a couple of examples, um, or maybe just one, but I think this is a really um, classic one and probably what is seen most commonly. Um, and put in the chat if you think you know what's going on here. And I, I just, and I will say what's going on under the gauze is really not much. It's like a little scrape really. Okay, so Katie says cellulitis. And pen lines are when to worry about spread or infection, yeah. Yeah, so you guys are on a miss, miss shot. It could have been from a miss shot. Um, I think in this case, it was from, the person was like reusing rigs because um, she didn't have access to um, to new supplies. But yeah, um, could be from miss shot. But yeah, this is a cellulitis. And if we go to the next slide, we can kind of see. And click again. Ah, oh, there we go. So um, we have this nerds and stonies um, beside the picture. So we can see around size. Um, so we had marked it with pen, the outline of the redness. And that's a good thing to do if you're wanting to see, like, is something getting better? Or is it getting worse? If the redness increases, it's getting worse. It's spreading. Um, and it can be good to be able to see that. Um, temperature, it was warm to touch. Red and bleeding, no, there really wasn't much of a wound there. Debris, no. And smell, no. We did have the erythema and the edema was a big one. And so these are kind of like hallmarks of a cellulitis. And also with cellulitis, sometimes you'll see, and you don't see it so much in this case, but that like that taut, shiny skin and that streaking sometimes. Um, and in this person, like the redness is quite prominent and apparent, um, but her skin is like quite pale. So for someone who has darker skin, you might not get that frank redness. And so you're really relying on the taut shiny skin um, and the streaking to indicate that there's a cellulitis um, and the edema and the warmth and those other signs are really important. Um, so this person did require oral antibiotics. This is the standard of care for cellulitis. Um, had it have been an abscess, Abscesses don't always require antibiotics. Sometimes they need to be drained, taken care of, and a systemic infection never develops. So just because somebody has an abscess doesn't necessarily mean that they require um, the antibiotics. There are other factors that would um, play into that decision, but not just the abscess itself. Do you, can you, uh, well, can you express sorry. about the pen mark? The pen mark is also a way of giving the individual some control over what's happening because they they can monitor um, the, the progression of what uh, of that redness or that tautness. Uh, and it's important that we do look at the skin tones of individuals and the darker the skin tone, the harder redness is to see. So you need to uh, compare between uh, like anatomical sites to see if there is a change in that, that color depth. Um, and I think uh, all, all of us um, are getting more comfortable with dealing with different skin tones and looking at subtle signs that happen there. Okay, the next. So we're getting right to the edge. Do we have a hard stop at one? I can, if people can carry on for a little bit, that's fine. It's up to you two, really. 
I'm okay. And I'll try to get right to the point. I'm sorry. There's just, it, I get so excited talking about wounds. Thank you all for your, <laughs> for staying with us. And if you have to leave, I understand. Um, I obviously did a good job, Erin, in brainwashing you. I know, to talk about wounds. Um, so this is another tool that just came out from Katie. So if you go to their website, you can order these. They're little pocket guys. They're laminated. They're cool. You can give them out to people. But this is also a way for us to identify potential for infection um, and to give out to people so that they can identify their own risk for infection. Um, uh, so yeah, you can order those on Katie. Um, this is like hot off the press kind of thing. Next, next slide. But Erin, I think that it's so important that we respect the individual for uh, and giving them um, some control over their own health. Uh, I know as I, I've been working in this profession for a significant length of time, there was a time that it was, you will do what I say. Uh, I don't care what you think. And I think we really do need to respect an individual's opinion and what they are able and not able to do and work all that into the plan of care. So, And that's the beauty of harm reduction. This is what we do. This is like the our bread and butter in harm reduction. And it's so cool to see. And we can apply it to so many different things like wound care. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, in terms of cleansing a wound, um, people always want the normal saline. And it's cool. Norm normal saline is a great choice. It's not the only choice, though. Um, in a pinch, I've used like a big handful of the um, sterile waters that you get in the injection kits. Um, if someone has access to uh, water, like soap and water is often a great choice um, for cleansing. So um, yeah, you don't have to be fancy. Um, any of these three options are great choices. And as Pat said, you don't want to just sort of like, like you wouldn't necessarily do this like sprinkling that the person is doing. You want to like get it wet, let it sit, let it marinate. Because as it's marinating, it is like taking up some of the gunk from the wound bed. So you have to let it marinate in the cleansing solution um, to really get the full effect. So just um, a word about tap water. Um, using tap water is perfectly okay. Just let the, the uh, tap run just to get anything that might be sitting on that, that tap out of there. Uh, however, um, you should be able to drink the water. And if you can't drink the water, then you probably need to boil it. If the water is coming from a well, uh, the well should be tested to make sure that it's fine. And just a point of interest, there really isn't any evidence to support one cleansing agent over another. So uh, what it needs to be is clean, I, I think is, is what you, because um, wounds, uh, unless it's a fresh um, post-operative wound, you really don't need to use sterile technique. Mm -hmm. Next. And these are my cleansing don'ts. My cleansing don'ts. People love using the alcohol swabs. And like, I get it because you're like, well, the alcohol kills bacteria. So it's going to like kill bacteria. The problem is it also kills healing skin. So skin that's trying to heal, you're like going to like knock it out with these alcohol swabs. And another thing is hydrogen peroxide. Um, and I like the bubbling is really satisfying, but again, it's like, if you get like road rash or something and there's like gravel in your skin, sure. Use hydrogen peroxide to get it out. But otherwise hydrogen peroxide is very cytotoxic, which means it's going to kill that new skin that's trying to heal. So I don't even keep hydrogen peroxide because I just find it very upsetting. It's really hard for me. Um, it's it, it's so ubiqu ubiquitous and everywhere, but it's really not the thing you want to use if you're trying to heal a wound. And Aaron, to that point, I would challenge any of you who ha think that alcohol might be a good cleanser to use it on a paper cut and see how it feels. <laughs> I mean, that's another thing. It's ouchy as heck. Yeah. Well, in, and uh, how many of you have used an alcohol hand rub and not realized you had a paper cut and use the alcohol hand rub over the paper cut? 
yeah, that is not time. comfortable. Yeah. yeah. The next slide. So I think I was doing, oh no, Pat, you're doing this one. Yeah. Yeah. So looking at what to put on a wound in, in fact, one of the things we say, it's not what you put on a wound, it's what you take off the wound. So if you can address the cause of the wound, if it's a burn, you take the heat source away from the wound. Um, there, uh, so you want, and you want to know the history and you want to know the underlying cause uh, and the underlying comorbidities that are going on there. When you have figured all that out, you can decide whether that wound is going to get better, whether that wound is not going to be able to heal at all, which is known in our world as non-healable, or whether that wound may close, but because of what's ever happening with the individual or what's ever happening with, to that individual within the system and the environment, it will not uh, perpetuate the closure of that wound. It's known in our world as a non-healing -heal or a maintenance wound. You can decide then what kind of um, local wound care you want to have. Wounds Canada has put together a very good step-by-step -step guide, uh, and Erin has included the website here uh, that you can go to that was created to help people actually during COVID to do wound care at home. Um, so it gives um, a good uh, as I said, step-by-step -step way of, of changing the dressing so that the people feel confident that they're not doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is keep that wound as clean and free from bacteria as you possibly can, and you want to keep it covered. You want to provide moisture. In fact, uh, back in 1962, George Winter did an experiment on pigs where he um, made a wound in a pig and covered one side with a wound that would retain the moisture in the wound and, and the temperature and let the other heal just by putting nothing on it. And he was the one that came up with that, um, the, both the moisture balance being very um, uh, important in how you dress that wound. Mm -hmm. You, If you have a lot of exudate or gunk coming from the wound, you want to choose options that will absorb the exudate if you have the ability to do so. And Wounds Canada does have what they call a product picker that talks about what dressings, what category of dressing does what that you can access from their, their website. And um, you know, people can have sensitivities and allergies to tapes and adhesives. And there are some skin conditions that you don't want to put tapes on. So again, that's the important thing to know the history of the individual. Mm -hmm. You want to secure that dressing um, so that you are minimizing um, what's happening to the individual. And I, uh, you know, you, you do want to, oh, sorry, you're flipping back and forth up here. Go one more, please. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> sorry, um, I touched something. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, but that leads, um, you want to change the dressings when they're soiled. So you may, with the group of individuals you're working with, need to provide those people with the, the dressings so that they can change them and, and teach them how, give them instructions how, educate them. You want to cover them, but not occlude them, which leads to the next slide that is an Aaron favorite. So, and this will let me uh, answer one of the questions in the chat. So this is an abscess and it was, it did require um, like surgical uh, an incision and drainage um, at the hospital. But what I wanted to um, illustrate here is we don't have great moisture balance going on with this dressing because if you can see the dressing that was put on is that kind of like plastic stuff it's like the stuff you put over new tattoos it's also um, put around IVs um, to protect them and it's occlusive so whatever gunk is coming out of the wounds um, like the pus it's going to stay under there and not get absorbed out um, so when Pat said you don't want to occlude you don't want the dressing to be occlusive. This is a prime example of where the dressing was occlusive. So we had to change this one out. But someone had asked, 
Yes, abscesses can heal on their own. And what do you recommend for people? Always warm compresses, like really warm compresses are a great way to get the abscess to self-drain. Um, and often if it's able to self-drain, you're just managing the exudate, you're giving them a dressing that's going to absorb the exudate, giving them lots of dressing supplies so that they can change it. And then people heal up on their own. Our bodies are pretty strong. So to answer that one. And then just I think, Aaron, yeah, uh, just a, a caveat to that. Um, really warm compresses. If someone has a neuropathy, and the neuropathy can be caused by diabetes or vitamin B deficiency or um, an overuse of alcohol may cause neuropathy. They need to be cognizant that they don't put boiling water compresses on their skin because they will burn and they won't feel it. So again, it's knowing that individual and knowing the history of that person that will really help you move forward with that, that skin care. The other piece, and I don't know, Rebecca, whether you can uh, point it out, but on that elbow, uh, on the um, picture on the right-hand side, you can see a white, uh, white area. Um, if we go back to that picture, a white area on the right-hand side, can you point it out with the pointer? Can you see that just at the top of where the hole is? I don't know how to get a pointer, I'm sorry. You, I think it's you're, just your you've, cursor. Got, you've got your cursor around there. Oh, <laughs> but no, it. just down a little bit, right where the hole is, you can see a white area and that is known as maceration. That's it. And that will cause the skin to break down. And what you're going to end up with because of this dressing not being, have enough in absorption, you're going to end up with a bigger wound and a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. So it really behooves all of us to think about what we have that will um, absorb moisture uh, and not put the plastic over it. It's a great dressing used in the right spot. That's right. <laughs> I think next okay. slide. Thank you. And so this is just another example of, um, this is actually a chronic wound that started out as, um, and in, this one did start as an injection related wound, but because it's on the lower leg and often in older folks, we don't have, you know, your, your veins aren't as strong as you age. So it's harder to get blood into the legs and you need the blood there to heal. So because he had the injury from the injection, I think he had an abscess there, but then also because he didn't have kind of optimal venous flow in his legs because of his age, um, that it became a chronic wound. Um, and then this is, um, you know, what a chronic wound can look like. And it kind of, it has features that let us know this wound has probably been around for a while. One for me is just that like slimy uh, wound bed where that's not coming off. Also the irregular edges. And I also find interesting with this wound, um, is the dressing, because I think the person who did this dressing, it wasn't me, okay, but like just used everything in the kitchen sink um, on this wound. Um, and sometimes it's appropriate to use multiple things, but I think often keeping it simple um, is the best strategy. Like, do you have something on there to manage bacteria? Do you have something on there to manage exudate? And then are you using an appropriate adhesive? Um, we can keep things pretty simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. And nurses love all of their like special, like um, all their special formulations and their goos and their this and that. But really, I, I believe you can keep things pretty simple and it can be very, very effective. It's important if you have access to um, some of the dressings out there uh, to read the insert in the package. Um, and I know it's really easy to either leave the insert in the, the box um, about how to use the dressing um, or just throw it out because it falls out of the box. But it is if you have access to some of the uh, dressings that are out there on formularies, read how it's supposed to be used. Uh, and you will get the best results from that. Can we advance two slides? So this is a quick list that I came up with about ways that 
we support people with wounds. And I think this is stuff that folks on this call are already very familiar with. This is what we do um, in harm reduction. This is so much of what we do. Um, helping people monitor for their own signs. And we know people really well, we see people a lot. We know when health status is changing, right? Because we get to see people a lot. Um, and again, I just wanna reiterate that like being part of Safe Supply, we're, you know, it's providing people with known drugs that have known ingredients in them. And this is a huge step towards improving the skin health of people who use drugs. So it's very cool. And also what Dolph is doing um, on the West Coast as well, we're providing um, drugs of known quantities and known content. These are all things we're doing to support uh, skin health. Just um, before we move on to the, the last uh, couple of slides, Asia, one of the things I might suggest that you get in your clinic is a bottle of povidone iodine or betadine. Uh, if you have nothing else to put on a wound and you want to reduce the bacteria or, or help reduce the bacteria, painting that that finger you were talking about with um, povidone iodine or betadine uh, is one of the ways to um, do this until someone can get help. And by the way, the product that Erin had in that article that I talked about first was betadine and that's what she had and that's what she used and that's what helped get that wound moving towards closure. So if you have nothing else, um, get some some povidone iodine in your clinic. Mm -hmm. Would that be good, Erin? Yeah, and shout out to uh, Camille who commented that the nurses at Parkdale Queen West Health Center are amazing with wound care and give plenty of bandages, gauze, gloves, everything you need to take home. So if you're in Toronto's West Ends, um, yeah, I mean, yes, the nurses at Parkdale are great. Go see them. Oh, next slide. So tools and resources. Um, these are things that you, um, resources that I have used that I rely on that are um, great for um, even sharing with the people we work with about um, wound care. Um, and I think the big one that came out um, was the introductory guide for assessing and understanding common wounds with people who inject drugs that was done by, um, I think Alex, Alex Dunn and Tim Gauthier, um, and Tim Gauthier who worked at um, Insight, or maybe still does. But that's a really good guide for common um, skin and wound things that we see um, in a harm reduction setting. Um, and again, the Wounds Canada um, Care at Home series that Pat was talking about. And now of course not everybody is doing their own wound care in a home, um, unfortunately, but it is, um, a good step-by-step -step about um, how you can do your own wound care that we can share with people. Um, the Katie Stop tool, which I showed you. And of course, all of you folks in the places where you're working, you're a great resource for people who are taking care of their skin and wounds. And then I think on the next slide, I just have a picture of some of the tools so people have a visual. And then I believe someone had a hand up um, and we might have a few questions. That was me. It was just, I pushed the wrong button. Oh, okay. Oh, well, hi. <laughs> so how do you properly bandage your nose? The best way you know how. Um, it, it depends again on what you have available. Uh, again, does the person wear glasses? Uh, is it going to interfere with their sight? Uh, the thinner you can make the bandage, the better. Uh, there are, if you, there are a lot of, um, I shouldn't say a lot of, there are foams out there that are um, made to be, um, um, made to be used on lighter skin color that would, would camouflage that there are bandages, that there is a dressing on the nose. Again, it depends on the size of the wound as well. 
Um, I know that there are a couple of products out there that have the adhesive part is clear and then there is a medicated part in the center, but is it big enough to cover the wound? So uh, I'm afraid I can't provide you and Aaron, maybe you can, but I can't provide you with, with a magical answer to that mm -hmm. because um, it, it really depends on, on what you're dealing with. Sorry. I, if you come up with a good answer, I'd love to know it. <laughs> um, wounds, unfortunately, don't happen on areas that are easy to, to dress. They always happen on a part of the body that is, is I don't know, when they do it to, to design the dressings, I don't think they put them on people that move around a lot. So. Yeah, often it's just creative cutting of tape for me. Yeah. And so you uh, your your um your, your kindergarten exercises yeah 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 it comes in handy <laughs> and i do want to like i do want to address the last comment i know people are really um that xylazine everybody's talking about xylazine and i just um i want to come back to this how are they presenting and how do you deal with them different than any other types of wounds you don't you don't, you apply those same principles of wound care to all wounds, including ones that are related to xylazine. And I think we really need to um, start finding common language for describing xylazine related wounds um, because we're not there yet. I don't think there's a lot of consensus about how they present, where they present. Um, and I think the more that we can have common language for that and be kind of taking note of that stuff, um, the better our evidence around it will become. Um, I don't know that I've been seeing a lot of xylazine related wounds um, in my practice, even though I know we do have some xylazine in the supply um, based on our drug checking. But I think, um, yeah, I would really encourage us to find that common language and always go back to the basic principles of wound care because they will apply to xylazine related wounds as well um, as they will relate to all wounds. If we can really cover those bases, uh, like those bases of basic wound care and the fundamentals, then we will be able to heal these wounds. And when you read the product monograph on xylazine, what it does is constrict the vessels so that you're getting areas of necrosis. And um, you would treat that, you know, I talked about whether that wound would, would heal or whether it was a, a maintenance or non-healing wound or a non-healable wound. And depending about, upon the extent of the necrosis and where that person is getting their supply, if they're going to continue using the same supplier, they're probably going to continue to get um, the xylazine. So you would want to keep those areas as, I would think, as dry as possible. So maybe painting them, those areas with betadine so that they dry up more cleanly and don't break down is what you do. But it, uh, again, as Aaron said, you just apply those principles. You look at the cause, um, you look at the individual and then you uh, go on to that local wound care, whether it's to provide moisture or to keep it dry. So there are other drugs, as I mentioned, uh, hydroxyurea is one of the drugs that will cause leg ulcers. So again, do you, does the person need the hydroxyurea to treat the condition and have the condition under control and they can develop a wound? Or do they stop the hydroxyurea so they don't develop the wound and get the condition out of control? So you have to weigh um, weigh what's going on here. And, and my, my best way of illustrating that is to prevent pressure injuries, the head of the bed should not be elevated greater than 30 degrees. So you have somebody that can't breathe. In order for them to breathe, they have to be sitting upright at a 90 degree angle. Is it better to have somebody that can breathe and have the potential to develop a pressure injury or have them at a 30 degree angle and they can't breathe and they can die so they don't develop a pressure injury? Mm -hmm. So you, you need to weigh the pros and cons of what's going on here. And I think with xylazine, 
we as helpers and healthcare providers, we do not have a lot of control over the silencing as of yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think lobbying to, I don't, this is not my area of expertise, but how do you get it out of that, the product? I don't know. But until that happens, um, we need to deal with the results of it um, and not so much focus on the actual product itself. And as Aaron said, describe those areas, whether they're pinpoint areas of black um, or whether the necrotic areas are just have common language and where they're occurring will help everybody. Mm -hmm. Sorry, a bit long winded, but. Thank you so much, everyone. And for sticking Thank with you. us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you both. That, you know, I don't know if you saw, but in the chat, people are expressing their gratitude to you both for, uh, for all this great information. Um, so yeah, it's been really super to have you here. And uh, I think we'll need to put you on our regular repeat uh, list of uh, people who come visit us and and share information because this is always really, really helpful um, to get the, yeah, to get this information. And please do reach out to me. Tell me what you're seeing. Um, yeah, I really, uh, I'm really so interested and in, interested in talking about this and learning from everyone. <laughs> um, and now I, yeah, um, Rebecca, I'm also interested in, and uh, we've shared Aaron's email but she will, uh, anything that she thinks I can contribute to, she will forward it on to me. So we will do a collaborative response to. Great. Thank you. And um, Alex, would you please share the uh, certificate link again? Um, sure, yeah. Us for that. Exactly. And we will, uh, we're gonna just check in with each other about the about posting the recording um, up on our website. Um, I think that'll be okay. Any concerns? Um, no, yeah. I think we didn't have we we were we wanted to um, hold off whether or not we agreed to put on the uh, the recording on the website until we made sure what conversations came up in the space because we want the space to be. Uh, warm and um, and comfortable for people but because we had it was so much messaging um, yeah we'll be posting the uh, the uh, recording up on the website probably um, by tomorrow it'll be up there um, under past events um, so yeah we'll get that up mm -hmm. up there and we do have uh, you'll find for those of you it seems this is a, a members meeting but I think we have a number of people here who are not members which is great welcome welcome um and I think the link got shared around and that's that makes me really happy but if you aren't a member and you'd like to have access to more meetings like this and other resources then do join uh, by going to our website and um Aisha you've got your hand up yes Hi. sorry I know this is the end of the meeting I was I'm having a dynamic day myself. I'm having vent cleaning happening. So I've been running all over the house trying to find a quiet place to do this. Um, I um I was wondering where would one find like resources in um in terms of like what to actually have in these um wound care kits and um we do outreach, so most times we'll see someone and might not see them again. So if they have an infected wound or just a wound that just needs a little, a little something. <laughs> what are some things that we could have in these kits where if we're seeing someone and maybe we won't see them again, that we know like they're going to be okay for a little bit before they like, hopefully go get it like checked out if they have the capabilities to do that. I can tell you what we have currently right now and can tell me if that's something uh, maybe we could have this conversation kind of offline um yeah you could uh but there is a book um Aaron and I believe you have a copy of it that Dr. Keys gave you for uh, resources um the book about resource limited um countries and wound care he just gave it to you at uh, the Woods Canada. Maybe we could um, share 
that okay. with um, Aisha. Maybe share it with everyone because not everyone has the ability to have access to whatever version of home and community care they have. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It might be a, a good book to just share around because it is, um, it's specifically designed at resource limited countries, which can be communities within Canada. Yeah. Aisha, will you email me? And yeah, we can I can email you. Yeah, email it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will email you and I've got the bottle of betadine on there. Right. I bet it's you already betadine. have all the stuff you need, but yeah, I'm just uh we've been getting a lot of uh requests for wound care or like specific yeah. care for wounds and I hate to tell people like, hey, 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 I've only got my first aid level one. Like I, this is all. So things like this are really helpful to like, yeah. kind of build that confidence and also just uh, to kind of know that we're on the right path towards this. Um, yeah, we don't usually, we're, we're for youths usually. So we don't really deal with a lot of wounds, but we do yeah. see like adult um, clients throughout the day. So Step yeah, up our game as we and see more need. Maria is just mentioning in the chat that um, the NSWAC is uh, supporting a new community of practice. Um, and one of, I think, their goals is going to be to create a standard list for first aid kits and wound care kits. So there might be more coming down the line for that as well. If there was a list as well of how to yeah. get the yeah. connections to get these resources and these supplies that would be awesome too does anyone have any leads on that uh other uh, yeah and it might be other people yeah. in your region too right because yeah. a lot of that is region de uh dependent what's exactly. available mm -hmm. yeah email me let's talk about it okay yeah <laughs> awesome. good, okay. i will <laughs> okay thank you Great. Okay, so please, everyone, take uh, Aaron's um, email address uh, and uh, contact Aaron if you'd like some more information. Or that would be great. And Pat as well. That's a connection through to Pat. Um, Aaron and Pat. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, yeah, and thanks to everybody who came out today and were wanting to learn more and and uh, share this information in your communities and organizations. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right, so let's say goodbye and wishing you. Oh, just a quick reminder that um, our drop in meeting is canceled for next week. Um, we'll send out an email to remind folks. I should have uh, had that on our list of things to say at the beginning of the meeting, but that uh, slipped our minds. Uh, Anjay, you had a question? Yeah, I just wanted okay. to ask um, when we, when we uh, do kind of um, uh, like, 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 I guess this could be classified as a training in a sense or. Or, uh, about wound care or or uh, like yep. not exactly a training but it kind of is a training yep. like in, in my mind um so uh like we have the certificate of attendance would it be possible maybe in the future when I mean, it's a broader conversation that we have like a certificate of attendance like tailored to a meeting that's on that's specific to uh like a subject matter like this so that people yeah, that's can that's a really good idea yeah yeah we didn't think of it for this meeting you can I mean, in yeah. In the certificate for this week, I added special wound care workshop. Oh, if that, Alex, of course. If that, you but, think about it. Yeah, but I, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Um, yeah, sorry. I'm not I sure if that's what, what you're looking for, but I think that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. And keeping I did only put for one hour, though, and it was an hour and a half now. <laughs> yeah. And keeping in mind, too, that depending on where you work and what kind of stuff you're doing, um, you know, you might not be doing wound care. You might be supporting people to do their own wound care more. Um, yeah, so I think that's a consideration also, um, just to make sure people are protected in their roles um, and not being asked to do things that are kind of outside of, um, or, or anything that could get them, you know, um, in a difficult spot um, where it's something that your organization wants, like, an RN to do or a nurse practitioner and all that kind of stuff. So it is a training, but with the mind that, you know, we all have to work within our scope. Um, and that I think supporting um, people to do their own wound care is also um, an art that a lot of us are doing in our practices. Thanks so much for saying that. 
that's a problem that often happens. Yeah. Real quick on Jake, because we need to. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll be super quick. Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with, with that sentiment. And I think that it should certainly not be fr framed like in the uh, certificate as like you're trained to provide wound care. And that's, it should be more like, oh, you attended something, you attended uh, like a webinar that was in providing information on wound care. Um, to kind of get get around that that uh, potential uh, issue, um, but I also I, when I went to the certificate, uh, as Alex mentioned, um, and I know we have to go. Uh, it, it, will, will it, it? It doesn't say anything in the certificate about it being a, uh, about wound care. Will it pop out on the other end after I fill out the form? Is that what Alex is referring to? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. It will okay. look like the same certificate, but then when it generates, it'll have special wound care workshop on it thank yeah. you Sorry. but i understand what you're saying it like it was this it's it's the same link yeah 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 okay thank you okay